Greetings, mother factors. My name is Sam, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the near legendary rock juggernaut that is Queen. If you're looking for facts about the Queen, feel free to check out our other video about the royal family, then come back here and watch this video because they're both incredible. The videos, I mean, and the band too, and the royal family, I guess. Fronted by the late great Freddie Mercury, Queen changed the face of music history, prompted a snazzy new feature film about the band, and gave the world several great options for fancy dress parties, which is possibly their greatest achievement. But what, oh what, are the lyrics to Bohemian Rhapsody actually about? Which classic British television show inspired the video for I Want to Break Free? And, uh, <laughs> do you think I should grow a moustache like Freddie? Could I put it off? I think I could pull it off. Anyways, two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so strap in, get snuggly and comfy, and prepare for the hammer to fall. Get it? Because it's the title of one of the songs. Yeah. Anyway, this is 101 Facts About Queen. Number one. Queen are a British rock band that formed in London in 1970. The classic Queen lineup consisted of Brian May on guitar, Roger Taylor on drums, John Deacon on bass, and the one and only Freddie Mercury on legendary vocals and very tight-fitting spandex. Number two. Queen's earliest music was inspired by heavy metal, hard rock, and progressive rock. But as the band grew, their sound moved more towards conventional radio-friendly tunes, incorporating arena rock and pop rock into their music. The sellouts. But in a good way, because I like those songs. Number three. Yeah. Before forming Queen, Brian May and Roger Taylor had played in a band together called Smile, along with a bassist called Tim Staffel. May and Staffel met while at college and decided to form a group. Soon after, they placed an ad for a drummer on the college notice board, which was fired by everyone's favourite drummer from Queen, Roger Taylor, who auditioned for the group and got the job. Hooray. Number four. Though Smile signed to, ironically, Mercury Records in 1969, Tim Staffel eventually decided to leave the group in order to join a folk band called, and no, I'm not making this up, Humpy Bong. However, Smile decided to continue with the help of someone whom Staffel had met in Ealing Art College, a funky little guy called Freddie Mercury. Well, kind of. Number five. Freddie Mercury was actually born for rock ball Sara in Zanzibar, the son of Parsi parents from the Gujarat region of India. Parsis are an ethnic group who emigrated to India from Persia at the time between the 7th and 10th centuries. Parsis practice Zoroastrianism, an ancient monotheistic religion that predates Islam, Christianity, and even Judaism. Number six. Balsara was later sent to study at St. Peter's School, a British-style boarding school in Panjgani near Bombay, now Mumbai, before moving back to Zanzibar in his teens. It was here that Balsara developed his interest in music and began to go by the name Freddy. Hmm, I wonder if that'll come up again later. Spoiler alert, yes it will. In fact, it already has. Number seven. In 1963, however, the family was forced to flee Zanzibar to escape the violence of the impending Zanzibar Revolution, and ultimately settled in Feltham, a large town in the historic county of Middlesex, right, that's us to monetize now, that's now located in the London borough of Hounslow, which is where our editor Chris is from. Not that there's a connection there, but it's also his birthday, so happy birthday, Chris. On fleek. Number eight. In England, Freddie sang in numerous bands before meeting with the members of the proto-queen band Smile. He was known for his wide vocal range, though it's never been proven to have stretched over four octaves, as regularly reported. The majority of his singing fell in the tenor range, which sounds impressive, I guess. I know nothing about music. Number nine. After meeting the members of Smile and seeing it crumble before his very eyes, as his mate Tim went for some reason off to play in a folk band, which I again remind you was called Humpy Bong, Freddie joined the group to keep the magic rolling and changed the band's name to, yes, you guessed it, Queen. Freddie chose the name for its obvious regal quality, describing it as a strong name, very universal and immediate, and, and I'm quoting, splendid. Number 10. But wait, aren't we forgetting someone? <laughs> of course we are. Everyone always forgets the fourth member of the band, John Deacon. After playing with several temporary bassists in their short history, Queen recruited Deacon as their permanent bassist in February of 1971, completing the classic Queen lineup that we all know and love today. Except for our other editor, Leaf, who I assume is even now peppering in jokes at Queen's expense. Number 11. The band rehearsed tirelessly and played a number of small gigs at Imperial College, eventually signing a recording contract and publishing a management agreement with Trident in 1972. Trident being a record label, not the, you know, coalition of nuclear forces, after which the boys began to work on their first album. Number 12. It was at this time that Freddie also changed his name to Mercury, after the line, Mother Mercury, look what they've done to me in the song My Fairy King. Number 13. Freddie also designed the Queen Crest, which first appeared on the back cover of their first album. 
The logo was created using the astrological signs of the four members. Two lion supporters representing the Leos, Deacon and Taylor, a crab representing May for cancer, and two fairies symbolising Freddy, a Virgo. Despite this, Freddy claimed not to believe in astrology because Freddie Mercury was an intelligent human being. Number 14. In July of 1973, the band finally released their debut album, the eponymously titled Queen. The album was widely reviewed as an imperfect but solid debut, which ultimately led to a big break for the band in the form of their first major tour, supporting a glam rock band called Mott the Hoople, because apparently in the 70s half of all bands had ridiculous nonsense names that were bad. Number 15. The band's second album, Queen 2, come on guys, you could have come up with something a bit more imaginative than that, surely, was released in March of 1974. Those boys work quickly. The album should have in fact been released earlier, but there was a minor printing error on the sleeve that Queen insisted on having corrected. Queen can do that because they're Queen and can do what they want. Number 16. Incidentally, Roger Taylor is on record saying he hated the title of the second album because apparently it's so unimaginative. I mean, yeah, Roger, I just said that. God. Number 17. Later in 1974, Queen released their third album, Sheer Heart Attack, which is often noted as the first album to feature the classic Queen sound. The song Killer Queen climbed to number two on the UK charts, taking the album to number two with it. It's all kicking off, guys. Things are about to get crazy. You just wait. Number 18. Sheer Heart Attack also gained popularity in the US as well, preparing the Americans for Queen's near legendary fourth album, A Night at the Opera, released in 1975. The band worked long and hard on the record, which cost £40,000 to produce, which is the equivalent to today's American money as over $385,000. This is rumoured to have been the most expensive rock record ever made at the time of its release. Number 19. The first single from the record, the iconic Sonic Voyage, a Bohemian Rhapsody, now I've never heard of it either, would eventually become Queen's signature song. But it took a staggering three weeks to record and featured 180 overdubs of vocals and instruments, including a Chinese gong. Number 20. In contrast, the music video for Bohemian Rhapsody took less than four hours to film, five hours to edit, and only cost £4,500 to make. See, they were thrifty when they wanted to be. Number 21. The song is known for the wild and energetic operatic section which contains a flurry of bizarre lyrics that include references to, among other things, the scientist Galileo, the Quran and the devil. This has led to years of eager listeners studiously analysing the song in hope of uncovering some kind of hidden meaning. However, when Mercury was asked about the song's cryptic lyrics, he simply replied, it bears no real meaning, it's all rhyming nonsense. Nice one, Freddy, keep them all guessing. Number 22! However, the immediate reaction to the song from the powers that be was not so overwhelmingly positive. Queen were told that the 5 minute 55 second track was too long to release as a single. However, Mercury managed to get a copy of the song to his good friend, comedian and radio DJ Kenny Everett. After hearing the song, Everett famously proclaimed that it was going to be number one for centuries. Well, I mean, he was wrong, right now it's Shallow by Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper, but you know, I mean, the, it's a great song. Number 23. Soon after Everett played the song repeatedly on his radio show, a display of loyalty to both the record and to Mercury himself that no doubt supported its immense success. Everett apparently loved Bohemian Rhapsody so much that he once aired the song 36 times in one day. Now look, I love that song, don't get me wrong, but 36 times? I listened to Mambo number 5 30 times in a day once and that nearly did me in. Number 24. Bohemian Rhapsody spent 9 weeks at number 1 in the UK, which isn't quite centuries, but it's close enough. This broke the record for the longest run at number one in the UK charts, soared into the top 10 in America, and quickly went platinum. Number 25. Despite having lessons since he was a child and playing the instrument nearly his entire life, Mercury didn't actually think he was a very good pianist. I said pianist, by the way, YouTube monetization system. As such, he was actually scared of playing Bohemian Rhapsody live. In later years, Mercury used the piano less in Queen's music so that he could get up and be free and move around the stage. And boy, move did he. Number 26. At this point, the party had officially arrived for Queen and all was right in the world. Well, um, there was actually quite a lot wrong with the world, but for Queen it was going pretty well. Though Mercury is commonly known as a gay man, he did in fact have relationships with women and is perhaps better described as bisexual. Possibly Mercury's most significant relationship with anyone was a woman called Mary Austin. Mercury met Austin in the early days of Queen and they continued their relationship for years until Mercury revealed he had numerous trysts with male lovers, at which point the pair separated. However, Mercury and Austin remained close friends. Number 27. Mercury's trademark bottomless mic stand was the result of an accident that occurred in the early days of Queen. 
Mercury's microphone stand broke during a show, and rather than run away and cry about it like a little baby, Freddy soldiered on, and turned the broken mic stand into a regular fixture of Queen performances. Since then, many other musicians have nicked the signature Freddy move, including Axl Rose from Guns N' Roses, Brett Michael to Poison, and Joey Belladonna of Anthrax. Number 28. At one point, Mercury apparently owned as many as 10 cats. According to his personal assistant Peter Freestone, Mercury put as much importance on his cats as any human life, which is slightly troubling. Number 29. In fact, Freddy loved his cats so much he would often call home while he was on tour and demand to talk to them over the phone. Number 30. Mercury required his assistants to carry a pen and paper with them at all times, so that he could write down ideas whenever inspiration struck. Number 31. Mercury was a keen philatelist, also known as a stamp collector for all you illiterate savages out there. Following his death, Mercury's stamp collection was bought by the British Postal Service for almost $5,000, and has been exhibited at stamp shows, which apparently exist, worldwide. Number 32. Brian May is known for his signature guitar known as the Red Special, which is used almost exclusively since Queen's beginnings in the early 70s, both for recording albums and performing live. May and his father built the guitar from scratch, creating the neck using wood from a 300-year-old mantelpiece. May has said that he and his father built his own guitar simply because they couldn't afford to buy one, though they had hoped to build something even better. Number 33. <laughs> Not only that, May also neglects to use a standard plectrum while playing the guitar, instead using a British sixpence coin to strum out those sonorous ballads and pluck his face-melty solos. May also says that the coin serrated erridge give his guitar playing a particular feel that he prefers to playing regular petro- oh, for f May says that the coin serrated edges give his guitar playing a particular feel that he prefers to regular plectrums. Number 34. Aside from being a badass bass player, John Deacon is also a trained electronics engineer, and he occasionally built equipment for the band. Possibly the most famous example of this is the so-called Deakey Amp, which was used by May throughout Queen's recording career. Deacon created the amp using, among other things, parts he found in a skip. Number 35. In the summer of 1976, Queen held a free concert at London's Hyde Park as a thank you to the fans for their success. The performance drew a confirmed audience of over 150,000 people, including among other people Mark Kermode and my actual mum, although they didn't go together, I don't think, with some estimates going as high as 200,000. To date, this performance holds the record for the highest ever attendance at a concert in Hyde Park. Number 36. In December of 1976, Queen released their fifth album entitled A Day at the Races, which served as a companion album to A Night at the Opera, both of which were named after films by the Marx Brothers. The album comfortably reached number one in the UK, Japan and the Netherlands, and number five in the US. Number 37. It was around this time that Queen experienced some degree of backlash from the rock press, as the emergence of punk rock clashed with the band's polished production and mass success. This led to a now famous meeting between Mercury and Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols, the details of which vary slightly depending on the account. At one point in 1977 when both bands were recording in the same building, Sid Vicious stumbled into their studio and said, Ah, Freddie Mercury, have you succeeded in bringing ballet to the masses yet? I mean, that's the best voice I could do for him. To which point Mercury responded, Ah, Simon Ferocious, we're doing our best, dear. Number 38. Mercury then stood up and began to playfully flick the safety pins attached to the leather jacket Vicious was wearing, and asked, Did you arrange these pins just so? Sid then stepped forward in an attempt to intimidate Mercury, who simply pushed Vicious backwards and inquired, What are you going to do about it? At this point, Sid backed down and left, presumably intimidated by Mercury's sheer charisma and potent sexuality. I mean, I assume I could be bringing a lot to that story myself. Number 39. Despite interruptions from prickly punks, Queen released their sixth album, News of the World, in 1977. The album was named after Rupert Murdoch's newspaper of the same name. Number 40. Oh dear. <laughs> right, right, okay. The album contained now iconic tunes like We Will Rock You and We Are The Champions, which have since become popular anthems at sporting events. The album also features the song Sheer Heart Attack, which is kind of confusing because that's the same name as their third album. It was originally meant to appear on there in fact, but ultimately was not included. Number 41. Both the music videos for We Will Rock You and Spread Your Wings were shot in Roger Taylor's backyard. The only thing that's been filmed in my backyard are those damn kids who keep stealing my tomatoes. I've got you on video, you hooligans! Leave my tomatoes alone! Number 40. Oh shit. The Meaning of Life. In 1978, Queen released their seventh album entitled Jazz. The songs Bicycle Race and Fat Bottomed Girls were released together as a double A side single, which makes sense because they're both about bikes. Bicycle Race was accompanied by a salacious music video that contained 65 women with no clothes on, all of whom were professional models, racing at Wimbledon Greyhound Stadium on bikes. Hilariously, when the company who owned the bikes found out about the video, they requested that the group purchase all the bicycle seats outright. 
Number 43. Of course, the music video irritated British people with the congenital lack of a sense of humour or fun. Nasty affliction, that. And was banned in several countries. A still photograph of the naked bicycle relay was used for the single cover, onto which a pair of red bikini bottoms was crudely painted on the nude cyclist. In the US, a bra was even added. Oh, can you imagine? Do you think a nude bicycle ride was a step too far, or are you cool? Let us know in our snazzy YouTube poll. Number 44. According to May, Freddie Mercury wasn't actually much of a cyclist, contrary to the lyrics in Bicycle Race. Which is literally just, I want to ride my bicycle, I want to ride my bike. Which apparently he doesn't even want to do that, so. The song also contained the line, and I don't like Star Wars. Again, May has since stated that Mercury actually liked Star Wars rather a lot. Number 45. In 1978, EMI Records decided to manufacture a limited edition of Bohemian Rhapsody to commemorate receiving an industry award for export sales. The 7-inch record, of which only 200 copies were made, was pressed in a semi-transparent blue vinyl. Now famous and highly sought after, bona fide copies from this original pressing can sell upwards of $5,000. Number 46. Funnily enough, the blue vinyl Bohemian Rhapsody record was originally going to be purple, in keeping with the band's original colours from the first album. The blue colour was a result of a printing mistake made at the factory, which Paul Watts, the then general manager of EMI's international division, delightfully referred to as a cock-up. Number 90, what? Number 47. Queen entered the 1980s with the release of their eighth album, The Game. On the strength of two number one singles, the jaunty rockabilly tune, Crazy Little Thing Called Love, and the funky, Another One Bites the Dust, The Game became Queen's first American number one album. Number 48. Mercury wrote the classic Queen tune, Crazy Little Thing Called Love, while sitting in a hotel bath. It's even rumored that he had his piano moved to his bath side so he could compose in comfort. Number 49. Interestingly, the band only released Another One Bites the Dust as a single because Michael Jackson suggested they do so during a backstage visit from the King of Pop at one of their shows in Los Angeles. Number 50. Queen also provided the largely instrumental soundtrack to the 1980 science fantasy film Flash Gordon, featuring the acting talents of Sam J. Jones as Flash Gordon, Melody Anderson as Dale Arden, and of course the very loud Brian Blessed as Prince Vulton. Number 51. In 1981, Queen collaborated with the alien demigod of rock, David Bowie, on the classic song Under Pressure. The song became Queen's first UK number one since Bohemian Rhapsody, and was included on their 10th studio album, 1982's Hot Space. Number 52. Funnily enough, Queen's collabo with David Bowie on Under Pressure was entirely unplanned and spontaneous, as Bowie just happened to stop at the studio while Queen were recording. Oh, the sweet winds of chance. Number 53. Hot Space also featured the dance funk track Body Language, which became a hit in the US despite a lukewarm reaction in the UK. The track's music video featured a copious amount of writhing, sweaty, semi-naked people, earning it the enviable distinction of becoming the first ever music video to be banned by MTV, which cited homoerotic content as their motive. Ah, the 80s, back when even MTV was homophobic. Number 54. Mercury wrote the song Life is Real as a tribute to John Lennon, and is one of the few Mercury songs for which the lyrics were written before the music. Mercury actually wrote the song's lyrics while the band were flying over the Atlantic from New York. Number 55. Hot Space and the more rock-oriented 1984 album The Works failed to replicate the success of previous efforts. However, one song by the name of Radio Gaga eventually became a worldwide hit, reaching number one in 19 different countries. Number 56. Another classic Queen hit from the album was the incredible I Want To Break Free, the music video of which had the band appear in a domestic setting dressed in drag. This was in fact Taylor's idea, who was inspired by the women of Coronation Street. I mean, who isn't? The video was made in response to their previous videos, which were often more serious and epic, as a way to show that they didn't take themselves too seriously and could have some fun with their music too. Number 57. However, the Corrie parody flew over the disappointing prudish heads of 1980s America, and MTV actually decided to ban the track, essentially ending the single in their country. Your loss, America. Number 58. In 1984, Queen released their very own Christmas song written by Brian May and Roger Taylor called Thank God It's Christmas. Relatively overlooked in the canon of Christmas tunes, in 2011, Thank God It's Christmas was nevertheless ranked as the third greatest Christmas song of all time by the readers of Rolling Stone. Number 59. In 1985, during a period in which Queen were on hiatus from recordings, Mercury released Mr. Bad Guy, his first solo debut album which contained 11 songs all written by Mercury himself. Initially, the album was supposed to feature duets with Mercury and Michael Jackson, resulting in the song There Must Be More To Life Than This. However, Mercury dropped out of any further collaboration owing to the fact that he was uncomfortable working with the llama that Jackson insisted on bringing to the studio. Yes, you heard that correctly, Michael Jackson was indeed as strange as the rumours suggest. Although, not those rumours. Number 60. 
Mercury dedicated Mr. Bad Guy to, and I'm quoting exactly here, my cat Jerry. Also Tom, Oscar and Tiffany, and all the cat lovers across the universe. Screw everyone else. <clears throat> well then. Number 61. In 1985, Queen played at Wembley Stadium for the international benefit concert Live Aid, organised by Bob Geldof and Majeur. The band displayed the extent of their considerable talent and skill, managing to produce a historic performance which has since been voted by industry professionals as the greatest live gig of all time. Number 62. During the performance, Mercury led the crowd with unison refrains of Aaah! which is now one of the most iconic moments in the band's history and indeed the history of all music. Seriously, it's up there with Living the Vida Loca. At one point, Mercury exhibited his prodigious vocal talents with a sustained note that's since become known as the note heard around the world. I mean, it was simul broadcast, but, and that's why, but... Number 63. The band's 12th album, A Kind of Magic, was an immediate hit in the UK, going straight to number one despite a frosty reaction from critics. The album produced several singles, such as its title track A Kind of Magic and One Vision, as well as Princes of the Universe, which served as a theme song to the 1986 British-American fancy action-adventure film Highlander. Nintendo 64 Another single from the album, entitled Who Wants to Live Forever, also appeared on the Highlander soundtrack, and was written by the band on the car ride home after seeing a preview of some of the film. Number 65 In 1989, the Queen released their 13th album entitled The Miracle, featuring this frankly horrific body horror affront to the Lord himself as its cover art. This was the last album that Queen released featuring a band photo on the front cover, and what a chilling photo that is. Number 66 like the previous few albums, The Miracle was received coldly by critics despite its commercial success. The album's most prominent single was I Want It All, which was written by May, who claimed the inspiration behind the song was his wife Anita Dobson, who once spoke aloud the song's ostentatious refrain, I want it all and I want it now. Number 67. In 1991, the band released Innuendo, which was a number one hit in several countries despite mixed reviews. The album's title track was inspired by rock band Led Zeppelin, and the song's lyrics were written as a tribute to the band. Number 68. The US version of the music video for the song These Are The Days Of Our Lives featured animated sections not included in the clean European version. These colourful emotive sequences were actually drawn by animators working for the Walt Disney Company. Number 69. Get down, make love. Mercury wrote the song Delilah in dedication to his favourite female tortoiseshell cat of the same name. I literally cannot overstate how much Freddie Mercury loved his cats. Roger Taylor, however, was not a fan of the song, and has since emphatically stated, I hate Delilah. Does he mean the cat of the song? I mean, either way, it's harsh, it's a cat. Number 70. By this point, Queen had been forced to significantly reduce their activity, as Mercury began to succumb to the horrific effects of AIDS, having been diagnosed as HIV positive several years earlier. Despite attempts to hide his illness with makeup, Mercury was visibly emaciated in the video for These Are the Days of Our Lives, fueling rumours about his deteriorating health. Number 71. Though those close to him knew that he contracted HIV, Mercury hid his diagnosis from the public for years. Eventually, however, the reality of his ailing health became impossible to deny, and on the 23rd of November 1991, Mercury issued a statement confirming he had AIDS. Less than 24 hours later, Freddie Mercury passed away. Number 72. In accordance with his family background, Mercury had a Zoroastrian funeral service, which was performed by a Zoroastrian priest. Number 73. Mercury left the majority of his wealth and assets to his longtime companion Mary Austin, with large amounts also left to his other friends and family. In addition, Mercury is also said to have left £500,000 to his chef Joe Finelli, £500,000 to his personal assistant Peter Freestone, and £100,000 to his driver Terry Giddings. Number 74. In accordance with Mercury's wishes, possession of his cremated remains were given to Mary Austin, who then buried them in an undisclosed location. The location of the ashes are only known to Austin, who has since stated that she will never reveal where she buried them. Number 75. Upon Mercury's death, Bohemian Rhapsody and These Are The Days Of Our Lives were released together as a single. The initial proceeds from the single amounted to roughly £1 million, and were donated to the Terence Higgins Trust, a charity which campaigns on and provides services relating to sexual health, primarily HIV and AIDS. Number 76. The following spring, the remaining members of Queen held a memorial concert at Wembley Stadium that was broadcast to an international audience of more than one billion people. The show featured the likes of David Bowie, Elton John, Annie Lennox and Guns N' Roses, and raised millions for the Mercury Phoenix Trust, an AIDS awareness charity that was set up in his name. Number 77. When Freddie died, members of the Freddie Mercury fan club raised £2,000 so that a new species of yellow rose could be specifically bred and named after him, as yellow flowers were supposedly his favourite. Number 78. In 1992, Bohemian Rhapsody famously appeared in Wayne's World, a raucous American comedy starring Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. 
The song appears at the start of the film when the main characters Wayne and Garth sing and headbang along to the song's operatic and rock sections while in the car with their friends. The classic scene took 10 hours to film, after which all of the actors complained of neck pain like the wimps they are. Number 79 Although Wayne's World was released in 1992, Freddie Mercury did actually get to see a preview of the scene before the film was released. Mercury apparently loved it, according to May, who noted that the scene was reminiscent of times they'd spent together in the car, listening to their own music. Number 80 The inclusion of Bohemian Rhapsody in Wayne's World resulted in a revival for the song, which immediately shot up to number 2 in the Billboard single charts 17 years after its initial release. Number 81 in 1994, Mercury was named in the suicide note of grunge pioneer Kurt Cobain, who explained how he envied and admired Mercury's ability to embrace and relish the love and adoration from the crowd, something Cobain felt unable to do himself. Number 82 Following Mercury's death, the remaining members of Queen were fairly quiet, with both May and Taylor releasing solo albums while Deacon basically retired. A final Queen album was released in 1995, entitled Maiden Heaven, which the remaining members of the band created using recordings of Mercury made before his death, while archival live recordings, DVDs and compilations appeared sporadically throughout the 90s and into the new millennium. Number 83 in 1999, Mercury was honoured in the UK in the form of a commemorative Royal Mail stamp, which depicted the singer on stage doing what he did best. Singing, obviously, I don't know why I needed to point that out. However, the stamp ultimately caused a degree of controversy. The only living people meant to appear on British stamps are members of the royal family, despite the fact that the very much alive Roger Taylor could be seen in the background of the image. Number 84 in 2002, Queen were given the 2207th star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, joining the Beatles as one of the very few non-American acts to be honoured in this way. Number 85 The Queen name was revived in 2005 with former lead singer of Free and Bad Company Paul Rogers filling in as lead singer. More recently, the remaining members of Queen have toured with Adam Lambert, a runner-up on the 8th season of American Idol. Not sure why either. Number 86 According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the official international Queen fan club is the longest-running rock fan group in the world. Queen fans are indeed a dedicated bunch, and uh, hello to you guys if you're watching. I hope you are, and I hope I haven't annoyed you. Number 87 Roger Taylor is known for taking a more active role in the songwriting process than many might assume of a drummer. Having written several hit songs for the band, including Radio Gaga, A Kind of Magic, The Invisible Man, and These Are The Days Of Our Lives. Number 88 Queen are also notable for being the only band in rock history to have had at least one number one single written by each member of the group. They were all individually talented, that's all I'm saying. Number 89 Queen's albums have spent a total of 1,322 weeks, equivalent of roughly 26 years, on the UK album chart. That's almost as old as our Lordess and Saviour, the majestic Jennifer Lawrence. I knew I could fit her in somewhere. Number 90 in 2007, Brian May was finally awarded a PhD in astrophysics from Imperial College London, the work he started all the way back in 1971. The title of his PhD thesis was <clears throat> A Survey of Radial Velocities in the Zodiacal Dust Cloud. Sounds, uh, yeah, sounds fascinating, Brian. Number 91. In 2010, Brian May formed an animal welfare organisation that campaigns against cruel practices like fox hunting and badger culling. The group is named the Save Me Trust after the 1980 Queen song from their eighth album, The Game. May has actually stated he'd rather be remembered for his animal rights work than his music or scientific work, which I don't think is going to happen, Brian. Sorry. Number 92. Of course, we couldn't end this video without talking about the Queen film entitled Bohemian Rhapsody after the band's most famous tune. Freddie Mercury is played by Egyptian-American Rami Malek, known for his roles in shows like Mr. Robot as well as the Night at the Museum films. The band's remaining members, Brian May, Roger Taylor and John Deacon, are respectively played by Gwilym Lee, Ben Hardy and Joseph Mazzello. I mean, look at Gwilym Lee, he looks exactly the same as Brian May, genuinely, genuinely to a creepy extent. Number 93 Freddie Mercury was originally going to be played by serial prankster Sasha Baron Cohen of Borat and Bruno fame, but he left the project due to creative differences with Brian May and Roger Taylor. May and Taylor objected to how the early version of the film centred almost entirely on Mercury, and also felt that by focusing primarily on stories of drug fueled parties and sexual escapades, Cohen wasn't taking the role seriously enough. May also stated that Cohen was too recognisable as his former roles to star as Mercury. Number 94 In response, Cohen has stated that May and Taylor were invested in creating a sanitised version of the band's history that would protect their legacy, rather than depict a warts and all reality of Queen's rise to fame. Number 95 even after Rami Malek was chosen for the role, production did not progress as smoothly as hoped. The film's original director, Brian Singer, was often late to set or failed to show up altogether, and on one occasion even disappeared for three days straight, leaving other members of the crew to step in to keep things going. 
After Singer allegedly threw something at Rami Malek when he complained to the studio about his erratic behaviour, 20th Century Fox fired Singer from the film with two weeks of filming still remaining, after which English actor and director Dexter Fletcher finished the film. Number 96. The role of pessimistic EMI executive Ray Foster is played by the one and only Mike Myers, who is himself a big queen at... <laughs> no, big fan of Queen. Who himself is a big fan of Queen, and as I mentioned earlier on in the video, I hope you were paying attention, was part of a famous lip sync to Bohemian Rhapsody in Wayne's World. Small world, more like. <laughs> Number 97. Yeah. Queen actually contributed to the film's soundtrack, which features classic Queen tracks, live recordings, and several songs that were reworked specifically for the movie. Number 98. Malik actually sent a video of him singing to the members of Queen, but when he finally met them, he discovered that they hadn't been able to download it properly. As a result, the members of Queen first saw the video with Malik in the room, which must have been a little daunting for him. Number 99. Malik actually met Freddie Mercury's sister, Kashmira Cook, during the film's production. Upon seeing Malik in full Freddie Mercury attire, Cook apparently laughed, though the moment eventually became very emotional for her, prompting her to send Malik a moving email in thanks. Dum, dum, dum. It's number 100. During an appearance on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, who I know is a big fan of this channel, so hi Stephen, Rami Malek named Lily of the Valley and Somebody to Love as his go-to Queen songs. Number 101. Malek actually still owns the prosthetic teeth he wore in the film and has stated that he will always keep them. Not in, though, because he doesn't, doesn't have to. Also, that's hy unhygienic, right, to keep prosthetic teeth in all the time. Just, uh, asking for a friend. Oh! So that was 101 Facts About Queen. What's your favourite Queen song? What's your favourite Queen album? Who is your favourite Queen? Let me know in the comments down below. Make sure to give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Facts for more goodness. That's right. Also, click on the little bell so YouTube will actually tell you when we make videos, because that'll be nice. In the meantime, oh, I hope you've been good, because we've got two videos you're going to absolutely dig on screen right now. Choose one of them and see if I'm right.